Thank you for everybody who uh, is still uh, bearing with us. Uh, hopefully, it will uh, be a very uh, a nice session. Uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Majid Ali Abdi. Uh, Professor Majid graduated uh, from, uh, in medicine from uh, uh, Karachi, University of Karachi in 1995. He completed postgraduate studies and acquired membership in the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Pakistan in psychiatry. Uh, he is Distinguished Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and has acquired membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists International Associate. Uh, and he started a career uh, with the development of psychiatry uh, in Ham uh, Ham Hamdard, uh, Hamdard College of Medicine and Dentistry. Uh, also, he is uh, working as visiting professor of psychiatry in the Institute of Clinical Psychology at Clinical Psychology in the University of Karachi. He has a number of researches and papers published in different scientific journals, and he is a life member of uh, not only Pakistani Psychiatric Society, but also member of American Psychiatric Association, European Psychiatric Association, and World Psychiatric Association. He represented Pakistan in numerous international conferences and conducted many workshops, organized many seminars. He is well known uh, for his keen interest in the project of social welfare for the promotion of mental health, and he is working as the head of psychiatry department and clinical director of Brain Clinic uh, Taj Medical uh, Comple Complex uh, in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, and uh, today, he is going to talk about a very interesting topic, actually, which is, uh, I believe all of us have been confronted with it, which is the genic presentation and mental health in Islamic world. So uh, we can uh, uh, have the talk started with Dr. Majid. And of course, uh, Dr. Amani, Prof. Amani was the, or is the chairperson for this session. She doesn't need introduction, but let me give you a little speech about her. Uh, Prof. Amani, uh, she's current consultant psychiatrist and in uh, addiction medicine at Irada Center for drug treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, was consultant psychiatry and addiction medicine at an Amal uh, Psychiatric Hospital. Uh, before, uh, professor in psychiatry in Faculty of Medicine Ain Shams University since 2007, and was mm, mm, sorry was National Institute of Drug Abuse before. Uh, Dr. Amani first turn an addiction clinic in a university hospital in Egypt. Moreover, uh, have been the main contributor to the development of drug and alcohol abuse treatment services, inpatient, outpatient, as well as rehabilitation, in the Institute of Psychiatry and Shams. So, and there's much more about Dr. Amani. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that we have three tracks. So, track one will be uh, uh, Dr. Uh, like Sir Prof. Amani will be the chairperson. Track two, Dr. Amnal Mismari will be the chairperson, and track three will be Prof. Talat Matar. And please, Doctor, the stage is yours. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you very much, Professor Amani Harun, for uh, making so detailed introduction, and it makes me difficult to present because when you when you heard about a speaker that he has got so many credentials, it becomes more difficult for a speaker to impress the audience because the audience starts rating him according to the introduction. Thank you, Professor Amani. And since it was a genic uh, uh, position and topic related to Jin, so you see Jin already started uh, interfering with my presentation. I was supposed to come and then 
it was missed by the, uh, oh, by the introduction of the chair. So uh, suddenly maybe I thought that some gin has started in, <laughs> instead of me. So as Professor Amani already said, this is a topic where everyone is interested. And I think uh, I should start with this declaration. So believe me, today's this lecture's objective is not at all to challenge your personal beliefs. Whatever beliefs you have about this topic, and similarly, my objective is not at all to challenge your beliefs. Whatever you think about that, I'm not going to challenge that. I'm not here to change that. But I would like you to actually think what actually Islam has about this topic. What information has been given to us by the culture, by the community or maybe by our grandparents, by our senior uncle and aunts, senior colleagues, and what is the actual and factual information, what Islam says about this topic should be understood by the audience. This is what is only objective. So that's why I think we will gonna have a good understanding about this topic. But before that, everyone knows what is mental health. Since the topic is the mental health Islamic world, I am practicing in a country where 97% population is the Muslim population, Pakistan. And probably we keep on having these kind of interaction much more in maybe the other part of the world because Pakistan is a very hugely, hugely populated country and I am working in a city which is the probably sixth or seventh largest populous city of the world. It has got 30 million population. So probably this is the, every day we come across many patients having the similar kind of a belief. But the people actually don't understand. In the previous session, uh, my very senior and worthy colleagues has talked about the stigma. And the stigma is still there that the mental health is, is associated with many beliefs which are actually not the factual belief. So we all have this understanding of mental health is actually a realization of my own abilities. And same time, if I'm able to cope with my normal stresses of the life, I should work productively and I should be contributing to my community. And of course, many times, we don't have a straight away methodology available so we can put a thermometer to the brain and we can identify these is the temperature of the brain or this is what is the actually the pathology of the brain. But we know when some symptoms which is significantly disrupting to the personal life or professional life of a person so we generally call it, it has got a mental disorder or mental illness. And everyone knows what are the causes. It's a bio, psycho, social model of the disease. We all understand structural lesions, genetical issues, neurotransmitter, personality type, recent life event, everything is one of the Research we did in our university hospital, before coming to psychiatrist or getting any mental health help, does patient have any ruhani or spiritual treatment before coming or visiting to the psychiatrist? And every patient who has been reported to psychiatric OPD were asked this question. And remember, when we asked this question in psychiatric setting, Many of the patients, they think that doctors don't believe on Rouhani treatment or genetic possession. So usually they try to hide. Or maybe because they, they think doctor might get angry that why you are taking those treatments, stop these and start mind treatment. So they usually hide. But the way they were being asked, it, it makes the chances become more. 
So 83% per patient reportedly said, yes, they have been taken some Rouhani treatment and the detail of the study said it is more than 2.5% per patient. So at least two and a half spiritual treatment before reporting to any mental health support or any mental health help. So why it's not been included? Uh, when we talk about causes, there is, there is no textbook says Ruhaniyat or a spiritual problem is causing the mental health. Should we include? Should we not? This is those who are working in Islamic countries or uh, dealing with the Muslim patients. It's every day happening. Are we really on a right track? Should we include some more causes? Just to have a, just to have an idea. Those who are agree, then we can add as a separate entity of causes of mental health, Durhani issues or these spiritual issues. Kindly raise your hand. So majority is not agree. Majority is not agree. Okay. Do any of person sitting in the audience has ever participated in election politics of national level or provincial council or the city's council? Uh, uh, three, four, three, two, three, roughly around 150 people are sitting. So less than 2%. So rest of the people have never participated and they are not having any experience of practical politics. We might have a lot of people who have been participating in professional elections, but I'm talking about general election, general politics, okay. Anyone has played cricket or soccer, as you know, cricket is a very famous game in Pakistan, but soccer is generally very famous across the world. Anyone who has played on a national level or even not national level, maybe a first class or provincial level soccer or cricket. Please raise your hand. One, two. Again, less than one percent. You are still playing? Good. Anyone of us have ever treated independently a patient of any disease before done your medical graduation or maybe a psychological post-graduation, please kindly raise your hand. It's a very common culture to advise many treatments, even if you are not a doctor. Everywhere, everywhere. Anyone of us who knows that he has done a religious course on a subject of applied Islam, and that is a sub-speciality of Islam, Islamic education, for Jannat or Jadu. Anyone, please kindly raise your hand. One, okay. So again, less than 1%. So, it is very common Almost in every society, there are, you will find almost everyone, and it is very high in our part of the world, that every common citizen is an expert of politics. <laughs> even if he, if he had never had an experience of even a local council uh, election or actively participating in a, any political party, but they can tell you what are the default of their prime minister in three seconds, and with an expert opinion that they are the most expert person. Similarly, if, you, if your favorite team loses a match of a cricket or a soccer, 
Everyone will be, oh, the, actually it is was the defender, oh no, the goalkeeper, no. Everyone knows the fault of the players. So they, they behave like more experts than actually those, those experts. Similarly, you all are facing these, the patients are coming to the clinic, and many times they start teaching you. The medicine you advise and the therapy you advise is like, I have gone through the Google and Google says this and Google says this. And everyone in the Islamic world particularly is, behaves like himself as an expert. Because on, specifically I'm talking about this topic. Because they have heard a lot of stories from their own mothers, nannies, grandmothers, grandfathers, cousins, aunts. Dr. Harun has uh, introduced me with so many credentials attached to me. But even if I am a very good teacher, if I say you that diabetes mellitus is happening due to infestation of plasmodium malaria, will you guys accept it? Absolutely no. And the reason would be, it is completely contradictory to the textbook of medical science. So if something happening contradictory to the textbook of medical science, we are not going to accept it. We all deal with the patient suffering with the mental health. Can anyone here can explain the Akidri Gautri syndrome? Kindly raise your hand. No one claims. It's extremely rare syndrome. Extremely rare syndrome. I choose and pick this syndrome's name especially. So see, if we don't have a textbook information about a topic which probably we, we might be never come across in our professional practice or maybe once in millennium, once in 30 years or 40 years, the chance of coming across with the Akedri Sai Gaitri syndrome is extremely low. Still, we are not commenting it. But everyone has expertise to comment on gen, genic position, and what's happening, how happened. Everyone knows. Whether they know about what textbook says or not, but they, 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 they can comment. They comment. This is what Akedri Gaitri syndrome but I already told you it's an extremely rare genetical disease. So, Quran has the chapter of jinn. If we are following Islam, if we are following Islam and we are Muslim, we have a chapter of jinn in your textbook, in Quran. How many of us knows exactly what Surah Jinn says and what is the description of Surah Jinn? Hardly few people, hardly very few. And you know what, uh, as uh, all of us know that Quran is an Arabic language and this translation is, is in a local language. It says, the, 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 this chapter, the textbook says, yes, jinn has some creature. Allah has made creature of jinn, of course, no doubt about it. Then jinn has uh, accepted the Islam as well. When first time they heard Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing the Tilawat of Quran while he was uh, on, on uh, uh, traveling, and after listening those tilawat, the jinn has went to their own uh, place and they talk themselves and then they make this interest. And the first time jinn was introduced by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu via Jibreel, via Wahi. So that means before that, 
even jinn was not able to interact with prophet muhammad according to the surah jinn and surah jinn says we have sent the chapter of jinn because the people should stop talking nonsense about the jinn these nonsense beliefs that jinn has got an special power jinn can benefit you or damage you is absolutely wrong this is what your textbook chapter says they don't have any power to damage you or to benefit you it is only the god who can damage and who can give you benefit and in the mid of the surah jin the topic of surah jin changes and it says the sajda the organs which you actually use for the worship to allah that's called sajda is only for god because before the prophet muhammad came in 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 that place people used to worship for the jinns or worship on some of the behalf of the jinnic beliefs and similarly at the end of the surah jinn the chapter of jinn allah says god says that we have closed this topic that they don't have any special power they don't have any benefiting or destroying or disturbing phenomena with human common human man they are not allowed to even interact with the common human man and this creature is been interacting through the mujizat with the prophets and mujizat you all knows is is an act by the prophet which cannot have a scientific explanation and the jinn the word jinn means hidden means you cannot see them you cannot feel them you cannot talk them you cannot they cannot talk you this is what textbook says and another thing which was associated with the jinn at that time was that they can tell you about the future and surah jinn also addressed that this kind of a knowledge is not at all belongs to jinns this is what textbook says and at the end they say textbook says this knowledge has been given to you because it has been given by the quran and it is the word of god so don't doubt on it and now close this topic for that community and for that culture and unfortunately even after 1400 years the muslim world has got so many absolutely wrong beliefs which are contradictory to the quranic chapter of jinn then the sahih hadith one of the very famous hadith which is acceptable across all the muslims is sahih bukhari hadith hadith number is 5652 book number 75 hadith number 12 it is a long hadith but i will just uh, give you a summary the one lady was brought to prophet muhammad and she was been having some kind of a fits and the attendant said she has been possessed by the jinn prophet muhammad says she is ill go and take to physician and get a treatment crystal clear order crystal clear order no ambiguity this is what prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and the same hadith says within few minutes that lady become conscious when she she was been told that prophet has said like this she asked the prophet if i am ill why don't you make a dua for me to allah that i'll be out of this disease prophet says said that you need to get treatment and you need to i will only dua for you for your parda 
So during this, all this uh, episode, you will not be having be pardgi, non parda. So only prophet did this dua by saying that God, if you able to know, the God will reward you for this disease. You will not ask me for this dua. So you should not get out of a disease. So she said, if God has rewarding me because of a disease, okay, fine. Only make dua for my parda. This is what happened, and this is what a hadith. So the first topmost textbook, second topmost textbook, crystal clear. So are we actually considering the cultural concept as an Islamic concept? What is the duty of a Muslim according to Islam? If Islam is a religion by a true God, don't Allah knows? Don't God knows the science? Don't He knows about the possession syndromes, conversion disorders, or epilepsy? He must be. Allah must be. God must be. So, are we misunderstanding the Islamic concepts? Probably yes. What is mojzat? Mojzat is the acts by the prophets, which may not have a scientific explanation. So it means another thing, everything happening around us, if it is not happened with the prophets, it might have a scientific explanation. It is yours, mine duty to, 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 to look forward and to search that scientific reasons. And that's what's very unfortunate. That's rather than what we have been taught, we are only behaving like if someone says this building is haunted, that place is haunted, our mind is trained from our childhood that, oh, okay, fine. Because we have been told by the grandmothers and aunt and uncles that it happens, so we have accepted it happens. We have never actually been knowing that what Islamic textbook says about this topic. Then, the power of jinn versus power of human. Clearly, in another part of the uh, Quran, Surah Naml, when it was described, uh, Prophet Solomon and jinn. Prophet Solomon was the boss of the jinns, and when Prophet Solomon died, according to Quran, jinn was not able to know. The, all the human in the, in, in prof, uh, around Prophet Solomon was able to know that he has passed away. The jinn was only able to know when his stick was gone through. Then jinn was able to know. And according to Quran, the jinn was actually humiliated by not having those information. So who is superior, human or this jinn? Very clear. Quran is very clear. Islamic scripture is very clear. Human is the superior. Human has the power. There are plenty of examen, uh, examples available in Quran when human prophets, which were actually belongs to human, Humans have been interacting with the jinns because of their special power of mojazat. But jinn were not allowed to interact with the common human being. So whatever happens to us, if we don't have an explanation, the most easiest jinn, jadu, japeta, saya, nazar, too many terminologies in every culture. And another example was, in, again, Prophet Solomon, there was a lady who was being the uh, uh, queen of one of the place, Malka Saba, Queen Saba. She was having a special uh, power with one of uh, his, uh, her big chair. So Prophet Solomon asked in his own uh, meeting where jinn and human being both were present. He asked, who can bring that powerful chair to me. One of the jinn says, according to Quran, I will bring it before your meeting will be over. The meeting was usually of two hours or three hours or five hours or one hour, we don't know. 
but it, he, he promised to bring that in few hours. Same time, one of the human alim of the meeting said, I can bring it just in the next second. So uh, Solomon asked him to bring and he brought. So he's superior. Human or jinn? This is what Quran says. This is what Quran tells us. I think since time is running short, so I'll leave this jadu. It is also very clearly addressed in Quran and very clearly addressed in hadith as well. So I'll go with the hadith which also support the Quran for the jadu. There is a very famous hadith where people says uh, Prophet Muhammad was under influence of a jadu. Someone did jadu on him. And one of these school of thought says he becomes a feverish. Other school of thought says no, he was not having feverish. For sake of argument, if we accept both, then the Jibreel came and this surat, Surah Nas came by the God. And what is the wording of Surah Nas? Klaus bin Nas. Min sharril waswasul khannas. So the jadu, Allah knows jadu is jadu. Why Allah is not saying, please save me from jadu? Why Allah is saying, please save me from waswas? Waswas is obsessions. Waswas is repeated unwanted thoughts. So Allah is, was very clear there is not such phenomena of jadu what we actually understand. It is just kind of a waswas. If I'll, if I'll talk to someone and, and I'll put a waswasa or put an obsession that someone is talking against you and if she becomes a little paranoid, I'm able to date the jadu according to Quran. Again, it is absolutely clear. I'm skipping this slide as well. So my question with the audience is, every culture has got a lot of Rouhani experts or spiritual experts for whom the community believes a lot of phenomena, a lot of things. Where their expertise, go, when these bomb blasts happening everywhere in the world, why their expertise is not working. When we need a renowned terrorist to be catch by any international army or force or police, why their power is not working that they can tell that terrorist is hiding that place, that terrorist is hiding that place. They are only, their power is working when somebody is ill and they have been gone to them and they tell, oh, your closest cousin has done jadu on you and one of the jinn has been possessed by you and I've been doing this and that. So many powers. Why they are not utilizing those powers for so excellent work for humankind? There is a lot of criminals are wanted by the law enforcement agencies. If all these happening, where are these spiritual powered person which exists in every culture everywhere and much more in Islamic world probably but I know it is very difficult to talk about that you are not suffering with the genetic possession or you are not having jadu by a common man because if we will talk like this he will reject our argument because he has a fixed belief that he has been what, what he, he or she has been told by the, his parents or grandparents or senior cousins and uncle and aunts without knowing what my textbook says. So my uncle, aunts, my grandparents always tells me good things, good things. So this would be absolutely right. So no need to think about it. So they will not accept. So we need to be very careful. Don't say straight away, you don't have all these. Particularly when people are coming in a culture like Pakistan, when they ask, Dr. Saab, I will continue the spiritual treatment and I will continue your treatment as well. Even that is acceptable. Because many times when they went to these uh, spiritual healers, they asked them to stop your medicine or your therapies. And the patient gets even 
more worse sometime. So it must be our smartness not to tell them to stop those treatments until unless those treatments involve some inhuman kind of a phenomena, which is unfortunately very common. Many times these spiritual leaders nowadays making some medicine to be filled in their holy waters and all these stuff, until unless if somebody says they have given us dua or the ayat or some, okay, fine, go ahead with it, along with the treatment what we are advising. And I usually say to my clients, no fights between dua and dawa. Dua is a spiritual treatment, there is no fight. So we can go along with both, but don't take some water or something like that which can harmful and which, 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 which is unfortunately happening too. Thank you very much and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdi, for this uh, interesting uh, and important topic. Uh, I will move right away to my uh, topic uh, because I know that there is a shortage of time. Uh, I will talk about a completely different topic, about dilemmas in the management of borderline personality disorder. Uh, hopefully, I, I have no disclosures, of course, related to this presentation. Hopefully, we can uh, have an overview about the current size of the problem and its burden, about the heterogeneous nature of the borderline personality disorder, complexity of the outcome assessment, dilemmas in pharmacotherapy, and dilemmas in psychotherapy. Uh, let's first be honest and open about this. Uh, how many of us work with borderline personality disorder? Most of the uh, people are working with it. How many like working with per borderline personality disorder? Okay. Apparently, none like <laughs> working with them. How many people refer borderline personality disorder to other psychiatrists? Also, it's good that not a lot of people refer them because in other uh, systems, people do refer them. Actually, I used to work in Egypt and people used to refer many borderline personality disorders to me in my clinic. So uh, I used to find that people do refer them a lot. This was the cover of uh, Times magazine. Uh, it, that, it was very strange at that time to say borderline personality disorder doctors fear the most which was very strange to have it as a cover on the uh, Times magazine. And uh, on the other side, in the journal, American Journal of Psychiatry, Kernberg and uh, Michelle Kernberg is very well known to work with borderline personality disorders, said that borderline dis personality disorder have long been to psychiatry what psychiatry has been to medicine, a subject of public health significance, yet it is under-recognized, under-treated, under-funded, and stigmatized. As with psychiatry and medicine, this is changing. New knowledge, new attitudes, and new resources promise new hope for persons with borderline personality disorder, which is, by the way, happening all through the way. Even this was reflected on the uh, books uh, that was about person borderline personality disorder. So before 1990, we used to have very few books, mostly psychoanalytic books and regular books, Starting from 1990, we started to have what's known as books for non-professional, which are basically the self-help books and workbooks for the patients. And we have increased in the number of the publication, as well as the decrease in the number of, of, of psychoanalytic books. So there was a change starting from 1990. What is the current size of the problem and its burden? Of course, at least 2% of the general population have borderline personality disorder. Some researchers say that they are up to 5 to 9%. Females are more, four times more than the males. 11% uh, 
of the psychiatric outpatients have borderline personality disorder. 25% of psychiatric inpatients have borderline personality disorder. And among the personality disorder, 33% of the outpatients and 63% of the inpatients meet the criteria for borderline personality disorder. And 60% have comorbid uh, depression. Of course, we'll discuss comorbidity, but it's very common to have comorbid major depressive disorder. And they have an interface with the healthcare system. So, uh, inpatient psychiatric units, of course, uh, top diagnosis for readmission to psychiatric hospitals in the emergency rooms because of the cutting and the self harm and the burning and suicidal threats and attempts. In the intensive care units and medical inpatient, of course, overdoses and other sequelae of suicidal and parasuicidal behaviors. And in the outpatient primary care, psychosomatic complaints, very common among them, as well as doctor shopping for, of course, uh, addictive drugs or prescription medication. Uh, borderline personality disorder can be fatal uh, through uh, the suicidal and the self-harm, suicidal attempts and the self-harm. So among the suicides, 40 to 65% have generally a personality disorder. Among these personality disorder, borderline personality disorder is the most commonly associated with suicidal behavior. And uh, actually, some of them, unfortunately, do uh, succeed to, uh, to commit suicide. Actually, 8 to 10% uh, commit suicide, 75 attempt suicide, and about uh, 70 to 80% have self-mutilation. Uh, borderline personality used to be viewed as a variant of schizophrenia, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and bipolar disorder. And actually, uh, the pioneer of the uh, treatment of uh, borderline personality disorder by DBT, uh, Marsha Linehan herself, disclosed that she had borderline personality disorder. And she herself was diagnosed as schizophrenia, and unfortunately, she was institutionalized for more than a year uh, and received ECT with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So this is not, was not uncommon. It can look like schizophrenia because they have hallucinations and delusions. And it can look like bipolar affective disorder because they have mood lability and anger. Major depressive disorder, yes, because they have suicidal, and suicidal attempts and they have depressed mood. And they can look like post-traumatic stress disorder because actually most of them have, have been exposed to uh, uh, child abuse. Usually, technically, of course, if we follow the criteria, we should diagnose borderline personality disorder starting as any personality disorder starting from uh, age of 18. However, practically and clinically, we know very well that the symptoms are very clear earlier. And they are even, uh, they have a peak at the age of, uh, peak frequency at the age of 14. And uh, being a clinician who see a lot of borderline personality disorder, I see a lot of patients at that age. And 80% of the teens with uh, borderline personality disorder criteria at least have some sort of personality disorder in their adulthood. Uh, of course, not necessarily borderline personality disorder, but they have personality disorder. 16% of them, 16 of them have uh, borderline personality disorder. Females are more common, and of course, we have a lot of celebrities who used to have borderline personality disorder. And in the, uh, of course, yesterday the, the, there were the big celebration of the coronation of uh, King Charles III, and uh, I myself uh, was uh, feeling a pity for uh, Princess Diana, who, who uh, lived and died and didn't have the chance to be a queen. Uh, uh, I believe some of the people also feel sorry for her. And she was, unfortunately, borderline personality disorder. Angelina Jolie, Britney Spears, Marilyn Monroe, all of these, and others, of course, a lot, uh, were diagnosed as borderline personality disorder. Some of them were diagnosed retrospectively as Marilyn Monroe, of course. There are a lot of dilemmas in the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. The first dilemma, as we mentioned, that most of them start before the age of 18. Uh, in, uh, for, from age uh, 13 to 17, 15% start to uh, have some symptoms. Uh, in the early ad adulthood, of course, the peak. Uh, from 18 to 25, 50% do present to psychiatrists. Young adulthood, uh, 26 to 30, 25%. It's very rare to have people presenting with uh, symptoms after 30 years, but uh, the 10%, which is 
not uh, uncommon. Actually, uh, I see a lot of borderline personality disorder patients, and I've seen only one patient above 40. Uh, but 30s, yes, I've seen, but only one patient above 40. Um, sorry for this. Okay, let's go back to... I want to go it, through it rapidly, but not that rapidly. <laughs> Oops, sorry for this. I'm going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Oops. Oops. I believe I need somebody to help me with the presentation. It went in. Oh, okay. So I'm going now in the right direction, backwards. I hope so. <laughs> okay. So precursors for the uh, precursors for borderline personality disorder that might be associated with subsequent development of borderline personality disorder, substance use disorder during adolescence, disruptive behavior disorders as con conduct disorder or uh, uh, ADHD or uh, oppositional defiant disorder, particularly uh, oppositional defiant and uh, conduct disorder, uh, depression in uh, childhood. Most of the people believe that conduct disorder must develop antisocial personality disorder. No, some of them develop uh, by uh, borderline personality disorder. And depression in childhood and adolescence, as well as deliberate self-harm. In adolescence, of course, there is no point in waiting till the age of 18 in order to diagnose, because if I'm waiting till the age of 18, that means that I will postpone treatment till the age of 18, which is, of course, uh, very, uh, very risky for the patients, because they might attempt suicide, they might do a lot of self-harm, and they are functionally impaired, so this will reflect on their own educational uh, career. So this is very important to start as early as we diagnose personality disorder. And uh, patients, when they do come even in adolescence, uh, the parents tell you that this child was different even during their childhood. They were temperamentally different and they are more difficult to manage. So even from childhood, people can tell that these, that these children are different from their own tips. So pre-adolescent and young adolescent girls do look like adult uh, borderline personality disorder patients, and the symptoms are mainly due to skills deficit. It's not acting out. It's not like the regular adolescents or like other, like uh, ADHD, or it's really due to skills deficit. And uh, that, that this makes it compelling to diagnose starting from the age of uh, 13. However, there is no evidence below the age of 12 that we can diagnose. Although, as I just mentioned, most of the parents give a history that these children were different from uh, their sips. Uh, of course, one of the dilemmas is that the, uh, the, uh, most of the criteria say that the symptoms must be, or the criteria must be there for one year. However, in order to disclose and to uh, tell the patients, particularly in the young age, that they are uh, borderline, some of the uh, clinicians do prefer to wait until two years of symptoms, particularly if the patient presents during adolescence, because sometimes there is overlap unless the criteria are very clear. So some of the criteria are really very clear that makes you really diagnose even after one year. So if the patients have frequent suicidal or self-harming behaviors, if they have marked emotional instability and uh, other comorbid psychiatric disorders, uh, and non-response to established treatment for current symptoms, high level of impairment in the general psychosocial functioning and self-care, as well as peer relations and family relations, we tend to diagnose early and we tend really to follow the one-year uh, uh, one criteria of the uh, classifications. Uh, as we said, whether to tell or not to tell the adolescents, it depends on 
uh, the uh, professionals, some of them prefer to tell, and actually I do take the side of those who prefer to tell, because this will make the adolescent have a relief that what they are suffering is a diagnosis. It's a disease that has a treatment, so it's better even in adolescents to, as long as we are sure of the diagnosis and we have the criteria that makes us very clearly diagnosing borderline personality disorder, it's very important to uh, really disclose the diagnosis because it makes them comfortable and it makes us uh, early intervene. So uh, this will help them uh, have good career, educational, particularly in this age, and they will not suffer. I have a lot of adolescents who have impairment in their educational career because they are excluded from attending the, the schools because of their self-mutilating behaviors. So uh, the uh, discipline in the school, just tell the parents, go treat your daughter because she is setting a model of self-harm to her colleagues, so we can never allow her to attend school. So this is really compromising their own uh, academic career. Uh, one of the studies that, are significant, that is significant in the uh, borderline personality disorder is the McLean study of adult development, and McLean is a hospital uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, so it's a very uh, specialized hospital, and they have a fund from National Institute of Mental Health for a study that has been run for 25 years following uh, borderline personality disorder. And they had uh, nice, very nice uh, conclusions that there is remission. And they followed, of course, the patients for uh, many years, and they concluded that the remission uh, in two years was 34%, in four years, 49%, in six years, 68%, in eight years, 80% and in 10 years, 81%, which is good. However, this is remission, this is not recovery. So they, may, although mention, they mentioned that remission is very high, remission uh, was not associated with full recovery in uh, all of them. So not all of them were functioning socially and occupationally as their own uh, colleagues. However, uh, those who remitted did not have recurrence of the symptoms, so this was good news. However, uh, some of them did not uh, have full recovery. Uh, actually, also, they had a very uh, nice thing that uh, they uh, also noticed that uh, suicide was not as high as mentioned in most of the studies, which was really uh, astonishing that this st study of 25 years, so suicidal attempts and self-harm was remarkable, yet the suicide itself was not that Hi. So this was a very nice study because it was very long, one of the longest studies following a borderline uh, personality disorder. And they had, they had also concluded that some of the symptoms do uh, recover earlier than other symptoms. For example, impulsivity recover earlier, while emotional dysregulation tends to take longer time to recover. So they, it was a very nice study. Those who are interested in the uh, borderline disorder, they should read uh, the study. They have published a lot of publications at different intervals of the study. Uh, what makes it even more challenging? Because comorbidity is very common, mainly with mood disorder, anxiety disorders, and substance use disorders. However, it's mostly comorbid with most of the psychiatric disorders. So with post-traumatic stress disorder, mood disorders, and panic and anxiety disorder, substance abuse, of course, one of the most uh, comorbid uh, problem with uh, borderline personality disorder, gender identity uh, disorder, uh, attention deficit disorder, eating disorder, multiple personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. I used to say to my students that those who are treating borderline personality disorder will understand and be clever in all the psychiatry because they will see all the psychiatry in their own borderline personality disorder patients. How does uh, comorbidity impact recovery? Uh, actually, uh, borderline personality uh, impact recovery on all access one diagnosis. So it it makes the impairment more and the tendency to remission is slower and response is less than those without borderline personality disorder. However, access one can also uh, compromise the uh, improvement in borderline personality disorder if access one is substance use disorder. 
So substance use disorder is the main disorder that can compromise the outcome of borderline personality disorder. And of course, if the patients have comorbid uh, depressive or bipolar disorder, we will definitely use medications. Uh, as we just mentioned, that the borderline personality associated with substance use disorder is one of the uh, bad complex or combinations. So it would lead to more suicide, more uh, risky behavior, which includes, of course, risky needle, uh, shared needle, and risky sexual relations. So there will be more hepatitis C and HIV infection. And, of course, this will... Uh, delay the uh, intervention for borderline personality disorder because we have to have at least three to six months of severity before starting programs for treating of borderline personality disorder. Dilemmas in the management are very, uh, very uh, complicated actually from the patient side and from the uh, clinician side. So actually we see the patients in different states, so they have fluctuations in their phenomenology and in their states, so this makes the uh, ability to treat them uh, much more complicated, and it, uh, it requires that the clinician or the psychotherapist be flexible. They have to tailor the treatment so that it's, it is a person-tailored uh, treatment plan according to the requirement of the, at the moment. So if the patient comes to me with suicidal uh, ideations, the, definitely my priorities will be different than if they are coming with interpersonal problems. So uh, this, this will be a problem. Also, uh, they tend to uh, make us have some counter-transference responses because sometimes they, are, they have anger, they have uh, impulsivity, they sometimes uh, detach from the treatment. So actually most of the responses make some of the clinicians uh, have counter-transference. That's why they refer them to other uh, uh, clinicians. So this is very important. Of course, the role of psychopharmacology in the treatment of substance use disorder is controversial. And the, the funny thing that we uh, use antipsychotics, although the patients are not psychotic. And we use antidepressants, although the patients are, are not depressed. And we use mood stabilizers, although they are not bipolar. So this is one of the dilemmas in the management. And of course, uh, we don't have clear uh, guidelines that, require, that say that psychopharmacology is of benefit in uh, borderline personality disorder. However, we still use medications. So before we start to use medications, we have to decide what treatment uh, your patients really need and require. So this is very important because psycho psychopharmacology is adjunctive to psychotherapy. Its, its role is important, but it's adjunctive. It is adjunctive in controlling affective instability, in controlling impulsivity, as well as in controlling psychotic-like symptoms. So it goes without saying that if I am treating affective dysregulation, I will use mood stabilizers. Some of them are uh, commonly used as carbamazepine, uh, oxycarbazepine, and valproate uh, if uh, the patient was not in the childbearing period. Uh, some of them are still controversial, like clabotrigine and topiramate. Uh, if the patient have quasi-psychotic symptoms, we will use atypical antipsychotics. And if they have uh, identity disturbance or chronic feeling of emptiness or abandonment, the fears, which are major symptoms, unfortunately, these don't respond to any medication. They respond, of course, to uh, psychotherapeutic interventions. Uh, of course, if, if there is no clear guidelines that really re uh, recommend uh, psychopharmacology. So if we are using them, we have to be very cautious. Uh, because if, if there is lack of evidence, we have to be very cautious. So the first thing is do no harm. We should consider the side effect profile, consider substance abuse history, and consider the most lethality in overdose. Because these patients, when they attempt suicide, the most common way is to swallow their own medications. Uh, so, regarding the antidepressants, the SSRIs are usually uh, very uh, safe and we use them a lot because they help with the uh, depressed mood, of course, and they help with the impulsivity. Uh, 
Uh, so they are commonly, very commonly used. Uh, we try to avoid as much as we can tricyclic antidepressants because they are catastrophic in overdose. And some alternative to SSRIs are the mirtazapine and duloxetine. Uh, if the patient has post-traumatic stress disorder, we have to uh, intervene early because this have, uh, will usually uh, make them hopeful in treatment because their treatment is lengthy. So we want them to improve regarding particularly post-traumatic stress disorder uh, because it's usually very painful. Uh, this is very important to avoid benzodiazepines because benzodiazepines, although they are they having low lethality in overdose, but yet they are highly addictive and disinhibiting. So they increase the anger outburst and patients tend to like their effect and they tend to be addicted to benzodiazepines. So this is a very uh, tricky because sometimes when the patient comes uh, with a crisis or comes in uh, post immediately after the trauma, uh, benzodiazepines is usually uh, recommended for the uh, early phases but early phases of post-traumatic stress disorder. However, never use it because they like its effect, they will get hooked on it. Uh, uh, I would like to mention here also that not only the benzodiazepines that are addictive in these patients, you will find these patients addicted to uh, very strange drugs which are not known to be addictive, but they take huge amount uh, of it. Some of the antidepressants, they take huge amount of it. Uh, particularly uh, some of the sedative hypnotics, some of the muscle relaxants. So they tend to, to use huge amount if they found it that it produces sedation. They tend to, uh, they want to go for a sleep, long sleep. And sometimes when you ask them about their suicidal attempts, they tell you, I did not want to attempt suicide. I just want to go in a semi-coma state until the problem finish. So they don't want to die uh, forever, they just want to pass this crisis by going into deep sleep for a while. So they like the sedative effect of any medications. Uh, and actually, sometimes you will find them taking uh, not only uh, benzodiazepines, taking a lot of medications, PRN. Actually, these PRNs might be uh, simple medications like Panadol Night, but they take it in huge amount, like taking uh, three strips per day. They take it in huge amount, and they tell you it makes real difference. So we have to uh, make them get out of these PRNs, and they'll tell you, I have headaches, I don't uh, sleep properly, so we have to know what is the problem. Why are they taking these uh, PRNs uh, in this amount and in this frequency? So we have to know, and if they need real medication, we'll replace it with uh, a, a safe medication, long term, uh, fix those and will educate the patients on the risk of taking these PRNs because some of them feel that it's just Panadol. Why, what, why bother? So we have to be uh, educating them about this. And we have to give them credit for reduction of the PRNs and for their own control of their own drug use. Of course, for anxiety and agitation, antihistaminics are good, uh, good a choice. Also, sometimes post some of the patients might benefit from pospirone or sedating mood stabilizer. We also have to mention that, uh, I will mention shortly now the psychotherapy, uh, but we have to mention to the patients uh, what skills did they learn? Did they try to uh, use the skills or not? Because we are, our aim is on the long term to make them use skills and to taper medications. So this is our long-term plan. So even if we help the patients initially with medications, our long-term plan is to taper medications and to get them off medications. And actually this plan is very good for them. Most of the patients would like to get off medications and most of the patients would ask you when I would be out of the medications. Uh, for severe agitation, of course, sedating antipsychotic as olanzapine, cotiapine, and chloropropazin, and uh, uh, these are usually uh, preferred. Of course, we have to treat the comorbid conditions, uh, and as we said, we have to taper the medication. What about last thing, psychotherapy? Psychotherapy is three uh, types of psychotherapy. There are the expensive type, which are 
evidence-based and more effective, actually, the day hospital uh, mentalization-based uh, treatment, in the day hospital, which is very expensive, of course, and the dialectic behavioral therapy, both are very expensive, yet they are very efficient. The medium cost, uh, these are high costs because they are both individual and group. The medium cost is the individual transference focus and schema focus, still uh, it has high efficacy, and the least efficacy is with the group for short term, like 12 weeks, uh, uh, something called STEPS, system trainings for emotional predictability and problem solving, and the manual assisted uh, CBT or cognitive treatment. These are the types, and uh, in general, this, uh, the uh, psychotherapy for borderline personality is not brief. This is a very important dilemma, particularly when you talk in the era of insurance. Insurance is uh, usually doesn't cover psychotherapy. So if it is a very long procedure, it will definitely not cover it. So this is a dilemma. And we have to have strong therapeutic alliance. These patients usually have attachment, detachment problems. So the establishing a strong therapeutic alliance in this patient is very problematic. And we have to establish clear roles of the patient and of the therapist. And this has to be stated clearly uh, in the contract, not only for the patient, also for the therapist. The therapist has to be active and there has to be a hierarchy of priorities. Uh, these patients have a life-threatening uh, behavior, so this has to be a priority. Therapy interfering behaviors, this is the second priority. And uh, lifestyle or quality of life interfering behaviors, this is the third priority. So any type of therapy has to put a hierarchy. Also, uh, uh, of course, we don't have a chance to talk about invalidation, but these patients, all of them have invalidation. So the therapists have to do empathetic validation uh, and will uh, also uh, appreciate uh, the, pa the patients need to control their own behavior. As we said, we have to be very flexible. We tailor the priorities according to the condition of the patients and according to the current state of the patients. Uh, it's best to be concomitant uh, group and individual. Um, uh, of course, as we said, suicidal and self-destructive behavior is very important. Uh, we have to diminish splitting because splitting is behind attachment, detachment, behavior, always set limits because these patients tend to have problem with their own boundaries. They encroach on others' boundaries and allow others to encroach on their own boundaries or to penetrate their own boundaries. So be very important in, it's very important to set limits and to put very clear uh, boundaries. boundaries. Uh, of course, uh, uh, therapists who deal with, psych uh, with the borderline uh, personality disorder patients will need to discuss with their colleagues and their supervisors because they suffer mostly of burnout. We need support if we are dealing with these uh, uh, patients. And of course, uh, treatment, even if it's psychotherapy, it has to be comprehensive. So it has to deal with the comorbid conditions as well. The general tips for working with people with borderline personality disorder is to focus on solving the non-medical problems. Focus on them, because these patients have a huge problems in the interpersonal uh, relations, in their own finances, in their own employment, in, they have huge problems. Uh, to agree on managing crisis, for example, to agree where they will be admitted, where they will be dealt with, and for how long at the time of the crisis, and become familiar with, of course, guidelines for anger and violent behavior, and recognize your own limits, whether to disclose or not to disclose, to tell or not to tell. Of course, it's better to tell. This enhances the patient's autonomy, and it will relieve stress because you will know that they have a, a, dis a disorder, and this is necessary for psychoeducation. And of course, now we are in the era of uh, uh, internet, so every patient come even diagnosing themselves. So we don't need to hide anything. We have to, to be very open and very clear from the start. And this will help them to be optimistic. They will read about it. And of course, we said we have self-help groups. Some of them are patients' experience. So this is very important. Borderline patients also should be able to assume that the professionals who treat them are trained to do so. 
Unfortunately, we have a shortage in clinicians trained in the borderline personality disorder, and evidence-based treatment require extensive training. If any of you have tried to uh, be trained in dialectic behavioral therapy, it's very expensive and very lengthy. Even the training is very lengthy and it's very expensive. And sometimes it requires group training, group of the therapist to be trained. So it's very uh, uh, extensive and expensive. It's essential to increase awareness of borderline personality disorder among people suffering from the disorder, as well as their families and the mental health professionals and general public by promoting education, research, funding, early detection, and effective treatment. And the final wisdom is that the world is full of suffering, but it's also full of overcoming it. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have, uh, maybe you can take a question or two. Uh, one question? <laughs> one question. We are beyond time, so we don't want to uh, delay uh, our next session. So maybe one question, and anybody who wants to ask uh, questions to me can approach me after the meeting. I will be staying late till the end of the uh, conference. Okay, so apparently no questions. So this is, uh, let's start the next session immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Banjad and Prof. Amani. So now let's move on to our next session. And the next chair of this coming session is Dr. Nail Mustafa. He is a consultant psychiatrist, Reem Hospital, with more than 15 years of experience in addiction psychiatry in the Middle East. And he did work before in the National Rehabilitation Center. Uh, please, doctor, the stage is yours. Good evening. Uh, I would like to thank you and I'd like to thank Dr. Methat and the organizers for allowing me this opportunity to be a part of this uh, great learning experience. And uh, because if we are running out of time, so let's go directly to business. Uh, I would like to present today Dr. Mariam al uh, She is a passionate psychiatrist with eight years of experience in general adult psychiatry and emergency psychiatry. Uh, she completed her training in psychiatry and achieved the Arab Board of Psychiatry in 2020. Following her uh, MBBS from UAE University, currently Dr. Al Suedi works with Dubai Police and is dedicated to advancing military psychiatry to create safe and mental health conscious communities within the workplace. Her expertise and enthusiasm make her a valuable addition to the field of psychiatry. And she continues to contribute to the advancement of mental health awareness in the community. Please uh, welcome with me Dr. Mariam, and with a round of applause, can you join us please, Dr. Mariam? Online, okay, so we will have Dr. Mariam online, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Nail, for your introduction. Uh, so this is Dr. Miriam Suedi, and I'll be talking about a topic that I believe is important to many of us, if not all. Um, it's about pain and psychiatry and how pain can be managed in the context of psychiatric comorbidities. So as we all know that pain is a complex phenomenon that can affect us in different ways, 
and can have a significant impact on our mental health and uh, well-being. So uh, in this presentation, um, we will explore the links between pain and mental health, including the role of neurotransmitters, uh, brain function, and psychological factors in pain perception. And uh, we will also look at common conditions that can cause or even worsen pain and compare the different pharmacological treatment options available for chronic pain um, in uh, in, uh, uh, with comorbid psychiatric disorders. Uh, so here are some of the useful definitions that I'll be using throughout my presentation. Pain, as we all know, is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. Uh, it's associated with the actual or potential tissue damage. Uh, acute pain is pain that is of a short duration. Usually it resolves within uh, the resolutions of the damaged tissue. Uh, chronic pain is pain that persists for longer than it would be expected. Uh, neuropathic pain is pain that arises from damage or dysfunction to any part of the peripheral or central nervous system. And uh, lastly is nociception, which is the process by which nauseous stimuli produced activity in the sensory pathway that convey the painful uh, uh, information. So pain, uh, pain and psychiatric disorder, uh, there is a correlation between both chronic pain and uh, psychiatric presentation. Uh, chronic pain is common in general population and it's a common uh, comorbidity presenting with psychiatric disorder. Uh, different comorbid psychiatric disorders associated with disability and poorer uh, treatment outcomes for chronic pain as uh, itself. And uh, patients with comorbid psychological and pain disorder at, uh, are at increased risk of misusing both opioids and benzodiazepine, both to treat their emotional and uh, physical pain. So as I mentioned, there is a reciprocal relationship between pain and uh, psychiatric disorder where mood and anxiety are the most reported comorbidities. Uh, both in patients with chronic pain, there is an increase, uh, like chronic pain itself increased the risk of developing psychiatric comorbidities, especially uh, depression and anxiety. And uh, the presence of depression and anxiety, uh, in addition to substance use disorder, increased the risk of um, the presence of chronic pain and the persistence of uh, the pain. So in different studies, it shows that individuals with chronic pain are more likely to present uh, with depression versus those without chronic pain especially patients presenting with fibromyalgia and uh, chronic orofacial pain, uh, whereas in anxiety, um, especially patients presenting with headache uh, and fibromyalgia as well, uh, were found to be uh, more likely to, uh, like patients presenting with these complaints are more likely to present with anxiety disorders as well. Uh, in addition to uh, depression and anxiety, suicide has a link with uh, chronic pain, where suicidal ideation among patients with chronic pain has high rates ranging between 5 to 50 percent, and uh, suicidal attempts ranges between 5 to 14 uh, percent. And controlling uh, for concomitant psychiatric disorder shows a significant risk of suicidal death uh, where it has been observed among patients mainly presenting with back pain, uh, migraine, and psychogenic pain. So different factors are associated with the psychiatric morbidity in chronic pain patients. Uh, so in uh, a study that has a sample of adult patients from um, an outpatient's chronic pain clinic, it shows that the prevalence of psychiatric disorder was up to 63% where depressive symptom disorder were the most frequent. And uh, it was linked with younger age of onset of pain and higher pain intensity. And both were independently associated with the presence of mental health uh, disorder. Um, higher pain intensity, negative pain cognition, 
uh, and problems with social and leisure activities were mainly associated with uh, depression. So in brief, type of pains can be classified into uh, nociceptive and neuropathic pain, where nociceptive can be divided into visceral and somatic, and the neuropathic pains divided into the CNS and the peripheral nervous system uh, pain. And here are some few examples. Uh, so in the periphery, there are different stimuli that activate the primary afferent neurons. And uh, these uh, primary afferent neurons are responsible for the transmission of pain. Uh, and uh, uh, the alpha, beta, and the C afferent uh, fibers are uh, mainly uh, participating in uh, pathological pain. Uh, multiple neurotransmitters uh, modulate pain processing in the spinal cord, and I'll be mainly talking about the serotonin, norepinephrine, and opioid. So there are two major targets for the ascending nociceptive axons in the anterolateral quadrant of the spinal cord, uh, which is the thalamus and the medial reticular formation of the brainstem. And uh, the spinal cells... Uh, axons that project directly to the thalamus, the spinothalamic tract cell, is the main pathway that is implicated in uh, human pain perception. Thus, uh, these are examples of the peripheral conditions that can activate the spinothalamic pathway, which would result in the acute uh, pain, such as joint affected by osteoarthritis, diabetic peripheral neuropathic pain, low back pain, and shingles. So with the continuous pain, um, the central nervous system can undergo many changes, including changes for the structural, functional, and mechanical, uh, making it more sensitive to the stimuli. So it can develop what's called segmental central sensitization and suprasegmental central sensitization. And uh, the segment in, in the segmental central sensitization, the neurons become uh, hyper excitable over time, after uh, the injury. And this will result in, uh, and here we can see the suprasegmental central uh, sensitization. And uh, the subsequent studies showed that the central sensitization is, can be maintained with or without the continuous uh, peripheral input. So the structural, functional, and mechanical changes I mentioned previously in the CNS may ultimately lead to a persistent amplified state of neural uh, reactivity, which leads to chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and the continuous somatic complaints that we see in the, on a daily basis. So there is a spectrum from mood and anxiety disorder to chronic neuropathic pain syndrome, where patients can present with any of the complaints and there is a mixed presentation between their uh, pr uh, pr between their complaints. So if we're suspecting a patient having a neuropathic pain, um, we need to do uh, like a detailed pain, pain history to validate the pain experience. We take a full medical history, including substance abuse history, review of prayer workout, diagnostic tests, and treatment the patient underwent, physical examination uh, specific to pain, such as pain-specific sensory examination or uh, musculoskeletal, myofascial evaluation, uh, not to forget the psychiatric assessments and uh, to screen for both depression, anxiety, and other presentations, and to include in, on, uh, on our documentation the nature of the pain, the intensity, the onset, and the effect of pain uh, on the physical and psychological function of the patient. Uh, different questionnaires are available for uh, neuropathic pain, for assessments of neuropathic pain. Some of them are just screening questionnaires and others are more detailed assessment questionnaires. And we can choose between them based on the case presentation. And this table, I'll not go through it in details. It can suggest screening questionnaires based on the presentation of uh, the patient. 
So assessment of depression in chronic pain, uh, cognitive and affective symptoms of depression, uh, sh it should be carefully uh, evaluated as uh, somatic symptoms overlap mostly with chronic pain. And uh, there is a concordance between uh, back depression inventory and the uh, structured clinical interview for DSM uh, to identify depression patients with uh, chronic pain. Uh, PHQ-9 uh, also is uh, one of the recommended questionnaire for rapid screening uh, in depression. So um, in this presentation, I'll be more focusing on tricyclic antidepressants, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, which is both effective in neuropathic pain and depression, and uh, also voltage-sensitive calcium channel alpha-2 delta uh, ligands, such as gabapentin and pregabalin. So uh, in regards to norepinephrine, uh, it is an inhibitor. An inhibitory, uh, it has an inhibitory action towards pain. Uh, it's involved in pain where pain can cause the activation of the norepinephrine system and the norepinephrine involved in decreasing the sensitivity to the painful stimuli and also pain relief. So norepinephrine may also increase the response to stress of uh, experiencing pain. Thus, due to deficient norepinephrine release, in some of the cases, it may lead to contributing factor of the painful somatic symptoms, such as the presentation in depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, and also irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, in addition to that, uh, so uh, in regards to that, when uh, the uh, SNRI and TCAs are given to patients presenting with uh, chronic pain or um, uh, psychiatric presentation, uh, it uh, boosts the norepinephrine action and thus it will result in inhibition of uh, pain. Uh, serotonin also has an inhibitory effect toward pain uh, perception. Uh, so the low level of serotonin may be partially responsible for pain severity. Uh, the perception modulation and the response to pain varies between individuals. Um, these differences uh, are determined in part by serotonin transporter function. And it's, um, as we all know, that serotonin function is found to be decreased in people with fibromyalgia. So deficient serotonin inhibition uh, leads to pain, and this uh, contributes uh, to painful somatic symptoms in depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, and irritable bowel syndrome as well. So similarly to um, uh, norepinephrine, SNRI, and TCA's uh, action boosts the serotonin inhibition of pain, thus decreasing uh, the pain uh, experience. Um, here are some examples of the SNRIs that is used for chronic pain. I'll not go into details because of the time matter. Uh, we have uh, daloxetine, which is FDA approved for major depression, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, and multiple neuropathic pain disorder. And it has a potential advantages for patients with uh, depression presenting with multiple somatic uh, complaints, fatigue, or pain. Uh, also, uh, milnacipran is another uh, SNRI, which is uh, FDA approved for fibromyalgia, but used off-label for major depressive uh, disorder and neuropathic pain. Uh, in addition to that, we have the venlafaxine and this venlafaxine. Uh, venlafaxine is FDA approved for depression, anxiety disorder, used off-label with neuropathic pain and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, having uh, potential advantages for depressed patients with somatic symptoms uh, and fatigue uh, and pain. Um, uh, and this venlafaxine, which is the same, FDA approved for major depression and used off-label for fibromyalgia and anxiety disorder. Uh, in regards to TCA, we have the amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Uh, Both are FDA approved for depression, used off-label for fibromyalgia, neuropathic uh, pain, uh, and anxiety. Uh, here we have a significant drug, uh, drug interaction. 
uh, this is a table that put together the doses of uh, the recommended doses for the medications with the daily antidepressant dose or uh, daily pain dose. On the other hand, we have the glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, it plays an important role in the neuronal activation. Uh, it mediates um, synaptic transmission of sensations such as pain and itchiness. Uh, so when an action potential on uh, presynaptic neurons uh, triggers the sodium inf uh, influx, uh, it leads to calcium influx and ultimately release glutamate. And an action potential at the presynaptic neurons will also cause voltage-sensitive calcium channel to remain open longer, allowing more glutamate uh, release, thus more stimulation of the postsynaptic neurons. Uh, thus, the nociceptive input is transmitted to the brain and acute uh, pain occur. Uh, the strong repetitive action potential can cause a prolonged opening of the channels, uh, leading to excessive release of glutamate and uh, at the synaptic cleft, so consequently to excessive uh, stimulation of postsynaptic neurons. This will lead to what's called sprouting, which is the theoretical substrate for central sensitization syndrome and the continuous presentation of pain. Uh, alpha-2 delta ligands, such as gabapentin and pregabalin, bind to a specific subunits of the voltage-sensitive uh, calcium channel, and it will change their uh, uh, formation, which will lead to reduce the calcium influx, and therefore will reduce the excessive uh, stimulation of the postsynaptic receptor, thus inhibiting the experience of pain. And here are the locations of the, uh, the uh, alpha-2 delta ligands presentation. So examples of medications are, uh, as mentioned, pregabalin and gabapentin. Both are FDA approved for post-herpetic uh, neuralgia. Pregabalin is also approved for diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy and, uh, other neuro uh, and neuropathic pain associated with the spinal cord injury. They both are used off-label for anxiety, and there is uh, it. Uh, it may both of them can be used uh, as adjunctive uh, th treatment with TCAs and SNRI, and uh, generally it's well tolerated. Yet there is the risk of uh, misuse. Uh, there, we have other medications that can be used for both chronic pain and psychiatric disorder, including lamotrigine, bupropion, uh, topiramate, carbamazepine, and onabotulinum toxin A. Uh, I'll touch briefly on cannabis uh, used for pain and psychiatric disorder, as it's not a psychiatric treatment used only for euphoric effect. Uh, it may use to uh, lead to misuse and negative mental health squally. Uh, there is a small trials of painful uh, with painful diabetic neuropathy, HIV associated neuropathy, and post traumatic post surgical neuropathy pain, which shows that cannabis has a greater analgesic uh, efficacy than placebo. And uh, in the Canadian Pain Society consensus statement. It, uh, considered uh, cannabinoids as a third line treatment um, for Dr. Neuro Mariam, uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, you have three minutes left. Okay. Thank you. Uh, benzodiazepine uh, is also used, but it may be prescribed appropriately for anxiety disorder, yet there is occasional prescription for painful septic spastic condition like multiple sclerosis. Opioid is not a psychiatric treatment used for euphoric effects. It has a high uh, rate of misuse uh, with long-term treatment. So there is uh, two meta-analyses that estimated the prevalence of chronic pain in individuals using opioids non-medically to be approximately 48 to 60 percent. And uh, those with comorbid psychiatric symptoms, especially depression and anxiety, are at a particular risk for developing opioid uh, use disorder. So this is just a recommendation from American Academy for the effective use of opioid for chronic pain. 
non-pharmacological treatment for chronic pain is also available, including CBT, mindfulness-based approach, exercises, and pain self-management. And uh, studies, uh, meta-analysis showed that there is, an, with CBT for insomnia, it showed uh, improvement post-treatment with pain, but the improvements at follow-ups were, uh, were not significant. So in summary, psychiatric comorbidities are common in patients with uh, chronic pain, which is associated with poorer treatment outcomes and an increased risk of substance misuse. SNRI, TCAs, and alpha-2 delta ligands and certain other anticonvulsants are considered as first-line treatment in a neuropathic pain, chronic pain, and are efficacious also with various uh, psychiatric comorbidities, especially depression and anxiety. Uh, opioid treatment for chronic pain is less effective uh, in the presence of psychiatric comorbidities where there will be diminished opioid analgesia and increased opioid misuse. And uh, by this, I reach the end of my presentation. I hope that I managed to be on time. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mariam. And uh, let's go to our next present, uh, pre presentation by Dr. Guatam Saha. Dr. Saha is uh, President uh, Sarak Psychiatric uh, Federation, founder and director of Clinic Brain Research Institute of Neuropsychiatric Discipline, Barasat. Dr. Saha's areas of expertise are in the uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of various types of mental health disorders, including substance abuse disorders. Dr. Saha rules are aiming at reducing the disability associated with various mental health disorders for better functioning for the patients. Dr. Saha will talk to us today about psychopharmacology in children and adolescents, recent updates. Welcome, Dr. Saha. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I must give my gratitude to the organizing committee led by Dr. Medhas and team, and also Professor Abjal Javed, our mentor, the president of World Psychiatric Association. Today I want to talk about, before presenting, uh, I was requested from by the organizing committee to be brief and short. I understand the Time is really, we don't, uh, we are running short of time. I'll try to be brief and for this I may skip some slides. So please bear with me. Thank you very much. I want to talk about the psychopharmacology in children and adolescents. You know that researchers try to discover the theory behind the process. But what academicians do? They try to collect all the theories behind every process. And the clinicians like me try to implement the theories to bring about patients' improvement. That is the basic, and that is why you are talking about the psychopharmacology. But why you are talking about psychopharmacology in this age group, children and adolescents? What are the important points? Number one, stigma. Stigma in psychiatry, we have discussed just earlier session, that stigma in psychiatry is very important, especially I am mentioning stigma against using medications for behavioral mental health issues in this age group is really very difficult and very stigmatized. You know that 7.5% of the 6 to 17 years olds are given prescriptions of drugs for treatment of behavioral or emotional problems. Though the 80% of the prescriptions written are not FDA approved. And also there are for fewer randomized clinical studies and trials in children and, than the adults often have no use the best judgment on the adult's research and the clinical experience. And you know that pharmacotherapy plus psychotherapy, psychosocial intervention is always better than individual pharmacotherapy or 
individual psychotherapy itself. This picture shows clearly that usage of psychotropic medications is gradually increasing except the mood stabilizer in this subject study. And also it is shown that the severe mental impairment in the young people are decreasing day by day because of psychopharmacology, use of psychoactive psycho drugs as well as the psychotherapy. So what are the scopes of my presentation? Today I'll talk about the adolescent brain, epigenetics and the adolescent psychopharmacology and review of medication by diagnostic criteria, problems in child and adolescent psychopharmacology, as well as what are the future directions. Now coming to the adolescence base. Before that, we should understand what is adolescence. It is in transitional, gradual transitional period between the childhood and the adulthood, which is maximally mainly characterized by the growth spurts sexual maturations, heightened social interactions, and the elevation in the novelty-seeking and risk-taking behavior. But how brain mediates this change? What happens in the brain during this phase? You know that gonadal hormones peaks, and with the peak up there comes with the structural and functional changes in the brain. Prefrontal cortex, parts of the parietal and the temporal cortex grows. Increased connection across the corpus callosum. And also the structural changes in the limbing cortex and the cerebellum. But the most important is pruning, synaptic pruning. It, what it happens, resulting in loss of gray matter and increased myelination and development of the new connection in the strength area. And which is, depends on, on the environmental changes, like childhood trauma or childhood good or bad experience, I'll come later on regarding this. What is epigenetics and what is the relationship it's to adolescent and psychopharmacology? You know that epigenetics refers to a change of gene expression or cellular phenotype that occurs without changing the DNA sequence. That is basically, it is a, some process involved the translation, gene expression. And how it happens, it actually includes uh, mainly three processes. Number one is DNA methylation, mRNA, small non-coding RNA, and also histone modifications. I'm not going in detail how the epigenetics, what is the biological changes happens. <clears throat> but the thing is that at this time period, the prefrontal cortex is primed to respond to the social, sexual, emotional stimuli with the epigenetic process, providing the conduit by which these environmental influences can permanently alter the directory, developmental trajectories. Although the working in the different capacities throughout the various developmental phases, the main factors that contribute to the epigenetic changes in the adolescent's brain are DNA methylation, as I mentioned before, histone modification and microRNAs or non-coding of RNA. You know the sexual abuse, addiction, and the environmental malstimulation, it may be the hyper or hypo, emotional stress, poverty, etc., all adolescents brain epigenetics and change the development and trajectory of the adolescent brain. So most psychotropic, but why I am talking this? Because most psychotropic drugs are epigenetic modulator. Though we don't know about their long-term effect, but they affect the epigenetics process. This slide, you can show that regarding the process of DNA methylation, the acetylopram and haloperidol acts, as well as the, whenever the histone modifications, there are active participation if they are under the treatment of clozapine or fluoxetine or imipramine or emisulpride. All these drugs have sometimes positive, sometimes innovative effect on this process. 
Now coming to the pharmacokinetics in adolescent and children, as you know that most of the psychotropic medications are highly lipophilic, so fat percentage in our body is very important. And the percentage of total body fat increases during our first year of life and decreases gradually in the puberty. And children have different volumes of fat for the drug storage at different levels. So doses should be according to their fat percentage. So we should keep in mind. And also regarding the metabolizing enzymes like COIP450 or phase two drug metabolizing enzyme are generally absent in, in infancy though rapidly developing over the first few years of the life. And it is also true in case of toddlers and older children may have levels of this metabolizing enzyme which exceeds the adult level. So milligram per kg body weight, maybe you need a more dose than the adults. And this decline until the puberty where they gradually remain the same until the adulthood. Regarding the pharmacodynamics, also the liver mass effects, you know the relative body weight and liver mass of a toddler is 40 to 50 percent greater than adult. A six years old is 30 percent greater than adult, so children tend to clear the drugs more rapidly than the adult. Children may require higher milligram per kg concentration to achieve the same plasma level. And regarding renal, by the age of one, GFR and renal tubular mechanism for the secretion have reached adult level. So however, the fluid intake may be the greater in children relative to adults, so therefore medications have more rapid renal clearance in children compared to adult. Now coming to how to prescribe in guideline in children and adolescents. Ensure the diagnosis prior to selecting the treatment. First, diagnosis is important. And then focus the treatment. Start low, go slow. Especially for the age group, this age group, but in different age group, in fact, in geriatric age group, also the same pause we follow. Factors, be aware of the age, weight, and the physical health. These are the important and monitor closely and update collaterals. Monitor for organic diseases. Monitor for trauma. Monitor for confounding factors, parents' mental health, development, and their academics too. And choose medication with high benefit and low risk profile. Once select the psychotropic, titrate the effective therapeutic dose range. Monitor side effects very closely and provide the regular education and counseling, especially to the parents. Be aware of routine administration of the physical health factor, avoid polypharmacy, and as much as possible, integrate the environmental and the lifestyle approaches, psychotherapy and behavioral approaches. Engage family, especially in this age group, and address the psychosocial stressor. Now the review of the medications by the diagnostic criteria. I'm not going into detail because all of you know that which drug we are using in different age diagnostic criteria. But in a brief ADHD, you know that prevalence is 5 to 10 percent and dysregulation of basically it is happened, dysregulation of dopamine and non-epinephrine and Neuroimaging studies also showed that the prefrontostriatal thalamocortical circuits, there is a problem. And if you see the medications, FDA approved, there are three category medications, especially the stimulant, methyl phenigrate, and amphetamine, selective noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor, atomoxetin, and long acting is clonidine and guafenacin. I know, don't know, that, but in India, clonidine is available and we're using very frequently. <clears throat> FDA-regulated medical food, phosphatidyl serine, DHA and EPA, and off-level we are using also sometimes antidepressant like tricyclic, bupropion, short-acting, adrenaline agonist, clonidine, as I mentioned, and modafil, modanifil, especially modafinil is, we are using when the... It is in adolescence age greater than 18 years. 
There is a study, multimodal treatment of ADHD study, and which clearly show combination is better than combination of psychopharmacology along with psychotherapy and psychosocial intervention is better than any individual treatment. So there are lots of screening tools to diagnose it, and it is shown that 60 to 75 percent efficacy in treating ADHD symptoms versus 40 to 30 percent placebo response in stimulants. And non-stimulants have a fewer side effects. That is why it was uh, these medications are used, and where the stimulants are, we cannot give, but less robust response. So practical steps is adolescents can start with longer-acting formulation, often start with methylphenidate product, but switch to amphetamine when methylphenidate trial is unsuccessful. These are the doses schedule. I'm not going into detail. All of you know this. Next is depression in child and adolescence. It's very common. One in 20 teens suffer from depression, and depression is a chronic illness, you know. There is lots of screening tools, but the treatment often includes very much close monitoring is important, addressing the somatic symptoms, education, social support, psychotherapy, and also the psychopharmacology. 40% of adolescents do not respond to the first trial of the antidepressants. So if no significant consideration, no polypharmacy, start with fluoxetine. Only FDA-approved SSRI for depression in children age 8 and up is this fluoxetine, and long half-life reduces agitation, risk of self-injury, less chance of serum concentration and fluctuation in non-adherence. So in medically compli complicated cases, consider the acetylopram or sertraline. But the, when you follow, the, if the first SSRI does not work in therapeutic range after 8 to 12 weeks trial, then switch to the another SSRI. If still not working, then only consider SSNRI or bupropion. You know that suicide is a black box warning. There are lots of trials regarding SSRI. There are lots of initial hiccup. But the subsequent studies showed that SSRI is protective against completing suicide and decline in SSRI use correlated with the surge in suicidality. I'm not going in detail there. So next is anxiety, you know. Hello, hello, please. Ah. Next is anxiety. You know, in anxiety also very common in children and adolescents. First we try for the cognitive behavior therapy, then go for the SSRI like sertraline or combinations. Regarding the OCD, definitely the fluvoxamine is the safest in adolescence group. But whenever you use fluvoxamine, we consider the age should be the greater than eight years. According to FDA, in sertraline, greater than six years, fluoxetine, greater than seven years, and in case of clomipramine, the age should be greater than 10 years. It can be augmented by the benzodiazepines or the second generation of antipsychotic. Post-traumatic stress disorder also very important, especially for the young subjects, young children. And it is very common, and they are the treatment in schools. Here are the role of teachers, role of guardians, role of parents is very important, as well as the psychotropic treatment, similar with less robust response. Though use of prajosin or clonidine for the sleep-induced nightmares, we can use this molecule. 
and also sometimes propranolol we can use for somatic symptoms like rapid heart rate or palpitations, anxiety for that reasons. Bipolar also controversial diagnosis, but I must say we should be very cautious about diagnosis bipolar because sometimes it is very much underdiagnosed. If you see that bipolar diagnosis average delay is almost 10 years. So whenever you see a patient, you should be aware that the patient may be suffering from the bipolar disorder. But the approved medications by FDA for manic or mixed state in ages of 10 to 17 years is lithium, quetiapine, risperidone, eriprazole, olanzapine has been approved to age 13 and up. And used, <coughs> also used, but not officially, carmamazepine, divalproic <coughs> monotherapy as augmentation to the above agent, as well as gipracidone, clozapine, and ECT in adolescence. Though in Mental Health Care Act 2017, in India, we cannot use ECT for adolescents in regular basis because it was not accepted by our government. Treatment considerations, as I already mentioned, that FD approval for the many and the mixed state, lithium, quetiapine, risperidone, and eriprazole, and other treatment also, valproic acid, carmomagine, and gipracidone. Lamotrigine also effective for bipolar depression, type 2 bipolar disorder. And minimal evidence for use of the topiramate and oxcarbamazepine. Many negative studies, so it is better not to use. Now coming to the oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, Actually, medications, uses of medications is very less and no evidence-based studies showed any improvement in this area. Only psychotherapy and psychosocial intervention is most important in these conditions. Autism also the same, no medication approved for the core autistic symptom. But psychotropics used to manage other psychiatric comorbid uh, comorbidities and impairing symptoms such as repetitive behavior, agitation, or aggression. <clears throat> in aggression, we used to use risperidone and aripiprazole, and, and which is also FDA approved. Other adjuvant psychotherapies are stimulant if there is an ADHD symptom, Clonidine and guavon, facing if repetitive behavior, agitation, aggression. Second generation antipsychotic, especially when mood liability, explosiveness, agitation, aggression. Naltrexin, primarily data, but not regular practice, especially in the agitation, sometimes we can use. And benzodiazepines, whenever the catatonia, agitation, or aggression. And very sensitive to adverse effect, even at the low doses. So what are the problems in child and adolescent psychopharmacology research? Number one, there are multiple views. You have to take the history from the parents, from the other guardians, from the patients, from the teachers, and there is much dissimilarities in the history when you are talking. So it is a problem to diagnose also. And the sponsor of the child psychiatric trials differ greatly in the guidance they provide to investigators for the handling the discriminant information that is elicited across the parties. Some sponsor directs that. Discrepancies in the report may be handled mathematically, though the averaging. Some direct that they may be handled by taking the most severe scores generated by one of the parties. Some direct that they may be handled by the investigators' use of clinical judgment after speaking to all the parties. Some provide no direction at all, it's likely resulting in idiosyncratic applications of conventions, lower interpreter reliability, as well as the less rating precisions. Worldwide, under the representation of the child and mental health professionals in many countries, 
pool of qualified and experienced child psychiatrists researchers are quite limited. That is also one of the limitations, one of the problems. And difference in the role of children across the culture. As I mentioned before also, the culture is a very important thing, like pathologic significance of behavior changes greatly depend on the child age and level of development. Like tantrum at the age of three years, normal, but not at the age of 17 years. Cultural, a Maasai child drinking fresh blood is a very much normal, though while an Indian child doing the same is showing abnormal development. So what are the future directions? The early life stress in the form of poverty, abuse, malnutrition, etc. can damage the normal epigenetic progressions. And if long term can induce permanent aberrant epigenetic progressions. And so pre-existing genetic risks contribute to this dynamic epigenetic process. And very interesting findings is that experiment with glucocorticoid receptor antagonist RU486 was able to reverse these early life stress induced changes in animals. So it is still in the research level. Hope something good come. If then, it will be definitely very important molecule for the child and adolescent psychopharmacology. You know that in a critical period of there is a study of vulnerability to adolescent stress Epigenetic mediators, it is a mesocortical dopaminergic neuron. It's finding a definitely positive correlation. Next is important is oxytocin. As we all know, the most popular nonapeptide in the recent neuropsychopharmacology research. Popular culture knows as a hormone of love. Good evidence concerning use of social anxiety disorder, autism spectrum disorder, and PTSD and early evidences regarding the effectivity in the schizophrenia, mainly in the negative symptoms, major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and the borderline personality. These are the studies that sniffing around the oxytocin and reviewing on the meta-analysis of the trials, LD and clinical groups with the implications of pharmacotherapy, which clearly show that, that it is very much important and very much effective in case of stress-related, especially in the childhood and adolescence. But it is also showed that if there is a history of trauma in the childhood or childhood abuse, then it is not so much effective if there are those who have the negative history like childhood trauma. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I Dr. think I'm in early time. You know? um, do we have a um, few minutes for? Okay, we have two minutes for questions. Um, any questions? Thank you so much for your presence and thank you for our presenters for sharing this. Thank you all of you. Still you are there in the hall and thank you all of
Thank you for this wonderful session and all the wonderful sessions earlier. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for their contribution, uh, starting with the expert speakers to the session chairs. Uh, now we come to an anticipated part of the conference. It's the announcement of poster winners. And I'd like to thank everyone who submitted their abstracts and congratulations for those who are chosen for poster presentation. And I'd like to call Prof. Madhat Sabahi, the conference chairperson, to announce the winners, uh, which will be followed by the closing address. Prof. Madhat. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your, uh, this wonderful congress. Thank, thanks, for, uh, Professor Afzal, for giving us this, this chance. Uh, we're going to uh, firstly announce the uh, uh, poster winners, and uh, that uh, will be followed by uh, the uh, other uh, winners for uh, the... Uh, uh, we did some contest, and that was uh, uh, evaluated, and um, uh, we'll talk later Professor Waqar and Professor Ahsan Nazir about them. Uh, so, uh, firstly, uh, regarding the poster winners, uh, you know, we had uh, many posters, and these posters were evaluated uh, according to some criteria that were, were there, and according to those criteria, uh, we chose uh, the uh, first three places for the winners of the posters. So uh, the first place uh, goes for a um, uh, poster uh, with the topic of our chatbots, our new therapist. And uh, this um, um, poster is, uh, was presented by uh, Ahmad Nazir and our co-authors, uh, Aliza Azim uh, and uh, Dr. Zayla Qayyum. And uh, um, Dr. Uh, Ahsan Nazir will uh, receive the certificate on behalf of the uh, first winners. Second uh, uh, poster uh, prize uh, goes to uh, uh, one of our dear uh, local, uh, locally uh, uh, placed uh, students, uh, and it was about the perceptions of undergraduate students regarding the accuracy of mental illness on screen uh, portrayals, and uh, that was uh, the, uh, led by uh, Lujin Sami Osman. And uh, the co-authors are uh, Yasur al Naimi, uh, Muhammad Farhan, and Professor Jigna Stout. <laughs> yeah. So. And third place, uh, actually it's uh, shared by two posters, and it's um, um, uh, really very innovative uh, posters. And uh, uh, the first one is uh, Psychiatrist Mongolian uh, National Center for Mental Health, uh, Mongolia, uh, about some mental health issues of offenders who convicted to uh, drug-related crimes. And uh, the second poster is uh, some mental health problems of female prisoners. And the uh, authors are Bigel uh, Ma, a pseudonym. I, I hope I pronounced it properly. And co-authors are uh, a bit difficult to pronounce. Uh, so please uh, join us on the stage so that we can uh, award you. Sorry, 
sorry for not uh, being able to pronounce it properly. And then uh, I'm, I'm inviting uh, my dear uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Awakar Azim and uh, Professor uh, Ahsan Nazir to uh, announce the uh, winners for the uh, uh, contest that we did for Ziri. So please, Krokar. So we have a very innovative uh, competition for best paper by the trainees. And uh, myself and uh, Professor Tariq Okasha were the judges, and we have received numerous very good entries from the Gulf region. And the winner is Dr. Michelle Shero, fourth year psychiatry resident from American University of Beirut. Professor Ahsan Nazir. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a little bit of a, a tongue twisters in this presentation, so I thought I will just write it. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to announce the winner of the WPA competition, WPA essay competition for medical students. Um, the essay title was Advancing Mental Health in the MENA Region, The Promising Path Forward with Digital Solutions. Uh, we received numerous responses um, from uh, the Gulf and the Middle Eastern region, and essays were evaluated uh, for clarity, for originality, for scientific merit and uh, innovations, and rated by the teams um, from judges from the Yukon, Rutgers, uh, University of Washington. And it's a player um, that I announced that the winner of the competition is Dr. Sabila Siddiqui. Um, Dr. Um, Spila is a fifth-year medical student at Dubai Medical College. She's a rising star in the field um, with a passion in medicine and uh, digitalization. She is aspiring to seek a residency in the U.S. Uh, with a goal to make uh, a meaningful impact on the patient's lives. So please join me to congratulate Dr. Spila. Thank you very much um, uh, for um, uh, uh, really uh, great support for WPA uh, for such a wonderful Congress. Uh, th thanks for Professor Afdal and for uh, the faculty of the World Psychiatric Association and uh, for the psychiatry rehabilitation section uh, headed by uh, Professor Johannes uh, Vankata. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, all the support from the uh, different sections uh, of uh, the World Psychiatric Association, uh, Professor uh, Thomas Schulz and um, the uh, rest of the uh, colleagues, Professor Waqar uh, Azim, Professor Ahsan Nazir. And I don't want to say, um, to forget anyone, uh, really, uh, your support, Professor uh, Shahid and uh, all our colleagues, really, I appreciate uh, your support. 
Uh, I cannot forget uh, the support of my dear colleagues in, in Emirates here and in the Gulf and in the Arab region. I'm really thankful for all of you. And before uh, closing, I need to give uh, uh, awarding to uh, our master of the ceremony for today, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Dr. Bassam Diyar. Professor Afzal to conclude, but uh, he uh, uh, assigned me to uh, say uh, thank you for all of you on his behalf. Um, Professor Afzal uh, is a very humble and very uh, supporting uh, professor. Uh, I cannot uh, forget all the things that he did uh, for me and for the region and different uh, scopes of uh, services in psychiatric rehabilitation and, uh, and World Psychiatric Association, and hopefully maybe in the uh, World uh, Health Organization as well. Uh, so we uh, please uh, share with me uh, uh, congratulating Professor Afdal for this successful uh, 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 conference and thanking him. And please. Uh, accept uh, uh, our invi invitation for future conferences and uh, all the best of luck well, and we yeah, yeah sure thank you thank you thank you very much and thanks for the guidance of uh, professor Abdel for this uh, see you soon, hopefully the same time next year in here. I hope all of you will be uh, with us here as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>